I'm the executive director of the Takami Program in International Health and a lecturer on global health policy here at the Harvard Chief Chan School of Public Health. And today, I'm delighted to have with me Ms. Fadima Maya Beal, the First Lady of Sierra Leone. Congratulations on completing your sixth year as First Lady. That's today, isn't it? Almost. <laughs> yeah, the anniversary is tomorrow, so welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to say that we are speaking on behalf of ourselves and not now on behalf of the school. It's a delight to be here, and I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are two days away from International Women's Day. You've been particularly active in women's rights and girls' empowerment, so I'd like to invite you to speak to us first about those efforts and the need for them. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason, for having me. Thank you, Harvard, for hosting me in uh, this prestigious school. Now, when we are talking about women empowerment, or we're talking about gender equality, I would really would like to refer back to the context as to what kind of equality are we looking for as women. Um, everything about women issue in the world today is a difficult issue. When you talk about rape, a lot of people think we are wasting our time as if it's not a big deal. When you talk about teenage pregnancy, knowing how many young girls in places like Africa are dying through teenage pregnancy, it doesn't look like it's a big deal. And um, if you talk about early marriage, you know, people actually use early marriage to legalize rape in Africa. Because as far as I'm concerned, when a child is, um, if a child is subjected to sexual intercourse by a man without their consent, it's legalizing rape. So these are issues that I believe we need to address. But the most important part of all of this journey when it comes to our gender equality issues in Africa is education, lack of education. If we can have African women educated, enlightened, and empowered, through education. Most of these things that are happening to Africa and uh, the women in Africa today will not be happening. It's not like, um, you know, what is happening in Africa is the worst thing than what is happening in Asia or what is happening in, in, in America here. The only thing is America have a system. America have a system. We know that if you rape somebody in America, there is a system that you go through and then you get justice. You cannot force a girl in America to be married off. There is nowhere somebody will give consent on behalf of a child in America to be married off. But then these are things that are happening in Africa and I think we, we need to really address them. The silence about these issues in Africa has gone on for far too long and I am bored of just being silent is the, 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 that ecosystem where a woman should not speak up. I don't belong in that league. I wanted mm -hmm. to talk. Well, I'm delighted and you're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> We're live on the internet and it's a conversation that's long overdue. I'd like to pick up one of the threads you just mentioned, which is a functioning social contract as between the state and its citizens, where a crime is committed, people agree on the policing of that, how you investigate it, how you hold accountable. One of the most fundamental corruptions of the social contract in human history is colonialism. And it's that mechanism that some states have used to extract resources from other places, such as Sierra Leone. That deprives countries of the resources they need for government services, for education, for health. So I was hoping you could reflect a little bit on what those forces have done to Sierra Leone, and what kind of accountability we might be able to think about, just to imagine a way forward from where we've begun now. When you, you look at what Sierra Leone have to offer, when you come to our mineral resources, the kind of mineral resources we have in our country is enough to take care of everybody in that country. We should not have a single poor person in Syria. But unfortunately, 
we are not given the free will to make decisions on our own when we are resources. There's always Big Brother who decides. And when you fight and say, no, we are not going to do this, they use the system to stop you. It's either they set you up with the opposition and they will be supporting the opposition against you from the back, or they cause unnecessary chaos in your country so that you are not able to even govern your own people. They will do things to make you not to be functionable. And of course, any country that don't have peace cannot develop. You have to have peace before you talk about development. I'll give you a simple example about Sulawesi. Every mining company that is in Sulawesi today is owned by a foreigner. Every mining company. If it's not the Chinese, it's the American, it's the British. Our electricity, Bubuna, is run by the British. And we still don't have light. We're looking for light. Electricity. If you don't have electricity, how can you talk about education? How can you talk about health facilities? How can you talk about improving the infrastructure of your country? We don't have electricity. Now, do we actually even have proper water, pipe-borne water, so that our kids will not be sick? We don't have those facilities. Why? With all the minerals we have, there is a cap you put before my husband became the president of Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone was benefiting. They said, uh, what's the word? 0.000.1%. What is that? Basically, a company can take as much as $100 million out of the country in terms of minerals, and then they can just give the country $10,000. Now, what will $10,000 do for our health system? What is $10,000 do for our educational system? And these are the things I believe that are stopping Africa from progressing. We don't have a say. The sense about us celebrating independence, I don't know why we celebrate independence, because we are not free. That is my own take. I'm not speaking also on behalf of the government of Sierra Leone, nor am I speaking on behalf of His Excellency the President. I am speaking as Fatima, as a citizen of a country who believes that things need to change. I joined you in that sense. I'm Jesse, I'm a person. Fatima is a person. We agree, I see you. I value your perspective and I wanna find a way forward. Right? Neither of us likes the status quo. No. We see women and girls being oppressed we see patriarchy stronger than ever. And we see colonial forces that persist without accountability. So it's one part to elucidate the problems that come from that. The many sequelae of extraction include inadequate remaining resources to develop as a state, to do all the things that people want to do for themselves, provide education, provide healthcare. So I wonder, as we think just as true citizens of the world committed to a better humanity, where do we go from here? Do you have any practical ideas about where we might start? <laughs> or collective ideas that we might gain support for? I feel Africa, we, patriotism is very important. You have to love your country to want your country to be a better place. Patriotism, I think we need to be, we have to have that sense of patriotism in our countries. And um, our leaders also should be subjected to that. You know, it is not only when uh, we were talking about election and then everybody come out and celebrate and after election, that's it. Accountability. Who accounts for what is happening? Who's the one who's changing the narrative of what is happening? Like I said, as a first lady, I am not part of a government system. I am a wife of a president. So when I speak, I speak on behalf of the people because I understand what the people are going through. At the end of the day, I'm not being paid salary, so and I cannot be fired either. <laughs> so that's the, the advantage, that's the advantage of being a first lady. But I believe that for Africa, what is happening in Africa today, it need to change and it need to change now. There is no time like now because for Sierra Leone, 
we now have a president who believes that we cannot wait for other people to come and develop us. We cannot wait for another country to come and prescribe how our country should be run or what we need in our country. You know, this divide and rule, if you're close to China, we will not come to your country. If you're close to America, we will not come to your country. I mean, the fight that is between England, Europe, America, China, Russia is not a Sierra Leone fight. That's not our problem. We are fighting for our daily bread. We are looking to have education, just like America. We are looking to have good health facilities, just like Europe. We are looking to have governance structure where a, one single person cannot be the dictator of a nation. That's what we are looking for. And in that process, we are going to be allies to everybody who wants us to grow. But if we now align ourselves with someone, and then this other person now is feel offended that, oh, you know, I'm, I'm coming from China now. I flew in, I mean, I've gone around the world to get to Boston, you know. I went to China and then come here. I will, before here, I went to England and then flew into America. For me, I am not restricted where I should go or who I should be talking to. I am going around the world to see a country that sees Africa not as uh, uh, and not just as an ally of what you'll be getting from us, but a country that sees Sierra Leone as partners and treat us with respect. You cannot be coming to our country and take everything that will make us develop, and then you still treat us as inferior people, as if we don't know what we're doing. I think that is wrong. You know, we're looking for partners that value us. People that will come to our country and say, you know what, this country has suffered enough. They need to grow. We were once the atom of Africa. Every country within sub-Saharan Africa used to come to Sierra Leone for our education. And today, what can we be proud of? We cannot talk about education in Sierra Leone because they ruined that for us. Everything that has empowered Sierra Leone has been ruined. And now we have a leader who wants to fix everything there is a problem. In Africa, you should not have a leader that is assertive, a leader that knows what his people want, a leader that wants to change the, what is happening. The moment you have that, it's everyone's target. And then they find reason to slow you down, they find reason to stop you, and they use that system of corruption. They use corrupt people, they use negative people, they use unpatriotic citizens to come after a government who is doing what is right for a system. I think we need to address those issues. Unfortunately, I don't know who I should, I mean, um, I'm very good at name calling, but at the moment, I don't know who I should be screaming at. I think that's one of the consequences of a system gone wrong, that there's no single individual responsible. No. There's no single place to go for a solution. It is difficult to find a way forward. And I think we can return to some of those themes later on in our discussion. But I, I wanted to ask you, in, this is a, in a very pragmatic way, your Hands Off Our Girls program. I wanted to ask you, who's addressed in Hands Off Our Girls? That instruction is not given to who? <laughs> the Hands Off Our Girls is for everyone. When I say everyone, when I became the first lady in 2018, the state of our country was disgraceful. It was disgusting. I mean, babies as young as six months were being raped by men. Yes, <laughs> and that's the reality. So there was no one out there to actually say it as it is. There is no one out there to say, no, we've had enough. And every time there's this excuse to say, oh, it was because of the war. Our war had finished 20 years ago. We cannot live in a war mentality after 20 years. We need to move on from that. And that's the reason why I'm very unapologetic when it comes to the Hands of Agriarch's campaign. I will call your name. I don't care your status. I don't care who you are. I will kneel and shame you and let the whole country know you're one of them. And what we have done through the hands of our girls 
I'm not saying it's amazing, but it has changed the way people think and the way people behave. And a behavioral change is one of the most difficult things for every society. But with the Hands of Ideas campaign, the perpetrators know the person who is at the front of that campaign is not joking. I admire that. And I think that's probably why in uh, 2023, UNAIDS appointed you as a champion for adolescent girls and young women. I'd like to pursue this question of accountability. The, the, let me, let me think about this. I think the, the circumstances you were talking about of low participation in national affairs, missing accountability for criminal actions, and then the need to change culture. That culture change is probably at the basis of our most fundamental problem. It conditions the way people look at each other, the way they respect each other. It also influences the way nations interact. At the beginning of our conversation, we were talking about the theft of resources by some countries from others. And here, where we're talking about individually perpetrated crimes on a mass scale, we're thinking about the same needs for accountability. So here, I know many of these things become personal for you, but I'm wondering, are there some next steps that you could envision us taking, either as domestic policy initiatives with either regard to a particular country or not, or as international citizens that might help us rethink the way nations interact with each other? Is there something that we could do from citizen to citizen that might help change these dynamics? Well, I think, um, you know, respect for one another is very important and the um, love for one another and compassion for one another is very important. That is what we have lacked for a very long time in a place like Sierra Leone. And again, whenever you bring up such conversation, they will try to make reference to the war. I don't think respecting a woman, you know, you, I mean, you, you need 20 years to understand that a woman deserves to be respected. I don't think so. I just believe it's the natural thing. It's where men feel like they are just superior and women are inferior beings and that we have to be silenced, that they could do whatever they want to do and get away with it because there's no one to ask them why. I think that's what has gone on for far too long in Syria. And with the advent of the Hands of Ideas campaign, they see it as me I mean, having a direct confrontation with them. Mm. And uh, of course, when you fight evil, you will try to fight back. And we've been pushing. We go 10 steps forward, they push two steps back, we move them 15 steps forward. And that's what we've been doing in the last five years to now. They have realized that this is not going away. So the best they've started doing is comply and know that. We are not joking. This is not a political um, issue. This is a national issue. Our children are being endangered. Our women are being bullied. Our women are being degraded. And we have 52% of our population who are women. And if you now push 52% of your population in the kitchen, definitely, it's like asking Mohammed Ali to, to do boxing with one hand. He will not succeed. Everybody had to contribute in nation building. If we want our country to be developed, the women and men had to work as partners. We have to be seated on the same table and make decisions together. Men don't know what are women's problems. It is only the women who knows our problem. And if we're not there when they make this decision, they will make a decision that fits their ego, not in our favor. That's a powerful sentiment. And I think the, some of the landmark changes brought about by Hands Off Our Girls include reform of the judiciary, reform of laws, advance in training, appropriate training for medical personnel. I wonder, do you see any parallels at the international level? Like, is there a way that we could reform the UN for greater accountability in the same ways? The United Nations is the United Nations. 
In the in the United Nations, it's the powerful and most powerful who survive. That's my take. For a country like Sierra Leone, <laughs> well, you know, this is where, you know, naturally I will not say anything. I will just let it go you're, you're because, fine. You're fine. you know, you're fine. I don't want to say <laughs> something that they will keep forever and say, but you said this about the United Nations. <laughs> but I think the United Nations needs a, a huge reform. Yeah. And when the United Nations speak, should be speaking for the world. Yeah. But it's like the United Nations is, uh, is an institution that, I don't know who is actually the, the head of the United Nations. So I know this is in, in a difficult spot for you, and I'll, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say it for myself as a, as a citizen. You know, the United Nations and their specialized agencies, they all have governance structures that privilege some nations over others. I think we should be able to talk about that openly, mm -hmm. and then we can talk about what to do about it. So in the United Nations in New York, there's the Security Council. Those are allies of the Second World War. Like, everybody should know this. Every should, everyone should be able to say this. And everyone should be able to say that the time of that is over. We need to think about how to make governance more democratic. How do you get to our one person, one vote? How do you get toward the autonomy of individual countries? How do you get toward good participation, strong accountability, and then responsibilities for people? I think the way you started on working on reform for women and girls is a template that can be followed for many other issues. Do you think of what a next one might be? Yeah, they, I mean, one of the most serious issues I have with the United Nations is the fact that um, Africa, Africa is not part of the Security Council. <laughs> We're talking about 52 countries, 54 countries, I'm sorry, 54 countries, a whole continent does not have one person representing Africa when it comes to decision making at the Security Council. And I'd observe also that no African country has its own executive director at the World Bank. No, so. unfortunately, yes. we don't know how to manage money. <laughs> I think I'll have to disagree. Uh, what, 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 what do you want me to say? Because if that is the perception since the beginning of, you know, every time an African come forward for something that they have to be a decision maker for the world, not just African, it's just not possible. I understand. So what can I say? There must be a prescription somewhere that says, Africa, you're not good enough. Well, it might be revolutionary, but I'm going to say it right here. Africans should be in charge of Africa. I believe that also that Africans' issue can only be enhanced when Africans decide to do that. They should not allow another person to give them a prescription of how Africa should look like or what we need in our Africa, because we know what we need in our Africa. No one will know that better than us. And I think the, the UN should see Africa as partners. And the United Nations, definitely, you cannot have seven countries vetoing everything. When it comes to Africa issue, it is those seven countries. Who are the countries that are actually exploiting Africa? They're the ones who have the veto power to make decisions on anything that has to do with Africa. So for me, I think that is wrong. And that is one thing the president of Sierra Leone has campaigned for. And this year, Sierra Leone is now a non-permanent member at the United Nations. But yet still, we don't have a veto power. But we're there. At least we are, come, we are getting closer. And in these two years, our mission is to get the United Nations to see Africa not as one country. Because that's the mistake they do. When you say I'm from Africa, they say, oh, you're from Nigeria. I said, no, Nigeria is one country in Africa. <laughs> You know, we have 54 countries.
not just Sierra Leone, go to Democratic Republic of Congo, go to the Botswana, go to Angola, go everywhere there is mineral resources. It is the West and the Chinese who are there. I think we need to work toward a future where those industries migrate toward the sources of production. So like you could imagine the chocolate industry that's not in Switzerland or Belgium, mm -hmm. but it's in Ghana. Mm -hmm. You well, could imagine, diverse. yes, the most famous jewelry stores in the world might be in Cote d'Ivoire. Oh, Sierra Leone, we have the best be diamonds. In, they might be in Sierra Leone. But guess what? We have the best diamonds in the world, what they call our diamond blood diamond. Well, I've never seen a red diamond. <laughs> because if it's blood diamond, it should be red. We have the best diamonds in in the world, you know. So I don't know what what do we have in America. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just checking you know, so I can. I told you I'm here yeah. to learn also. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, you know. You can't just be asking. You give me some information to take home. Of course, I'll be happy to tell you. The U.S. makes, uh, we have good beef here. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. 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 Have you test our yeah. cows? We have uh, computer chips. <laughs> We've developed the internet. I mean, there's lots of innovation. I think normal exchange is normal. People learn from each other. They share products. That's a kind of very normal, normal type of globalization where people have learned from each other. The extractive kind is what we need to move beyond. Mm -hmm. My aspirations, as I was mentioning to you, is that maybe we could imagine a world where the minerals that are extracted get refined, get processed into consumer products at the sources. Well, mm -hmm. first of all, for that to happen, you have to have energy. Mm -hmm. Now check how many countries actually have energy. And who gives energy? I understand it's complex. You know, it, it's it, it's true. It's complex. It's very difficult. I just don't want to give up on it. Yeah. At the end of the day, like we're all people, yeah. there should be something that good people can do. There should be at least one thing that good people can do, no matter where they are, no matter what their position is. There should be at least one thing. And I'm trying to find out what would it be. What would we recommend? to today's people. What should they do? We've identified many problems from the governance of the UN, the extraction of natural resources, the power of the patriarchy. Do you have any ideas? What should somebody do tomorrow? What would we recommend to the students at our school or the people on the streets? I think um, uh, people who, if, let me speak for Africa. When you come to Africa, Ask me what is it that I want. If you ask me what food do you want to eat, I'll tell you I want to eat rice. But then if you come to Africa and bring me spaghetti and said I want you to eat spaghetti, that you're imposing on me. With everything that we have in Africa, for all the people or all the organization or all the companies that are coming to take from us, for once, see us as partners. For once, Treat us with respect and then help us develop. Because when we're developed, doesn't mean you will not do your mining. It just means you'll be changing lives and changing lives in a positive way. So by depriving us that development, by depriving us that opportunity for us to be able to be self-sufficient, for me, that is what is wrong. And that is why I am not able to stay silent. I salute that. So today we have found solutions at several different levels. There's personal participation. So people are accountable, people are responsible for their own countries and their own actions for their own governments. That includes people in rich countries. If you don't like what your country is doing, maybe get out there on the streets and do something different. If you see people who are being taken advantage of, advocate for them, change the law. If you're working on international projects, respect people in their countries as the source of all the knowledge and maybe provide resources and advice as requested. I think that's good advice and I appreciate you sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today.